this is a, a really important topic coming up, and I, I really couldn't think of three better people uh, to discuss it. So first, you will hear from Lucy Culp. She is the Executive Director of State Government Affairs at Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Uh, she leads our team of government affairs staff members who advocate for policy change uh, at the state level to ensure blood cancer patients uh, have access to affordable health care. Uh, before joining LLS, she spent more than a decade at the Heart Association working on tobacco prevention, uh, state Affordable Care Act issues, and a ton of other policies. Uh, she also serves as a consumer representative to the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. Uh, after Lucy, you'll hear from Sarah Gantz. Uh, Sarah's a reporter for the Philadelphia Inquirer, where she writes about the cost of health care and insurance, uh, including how COVID has affected the way uh, people access and pay for care. Uh, before joining the Inquirer, she was a business reporter at the Baltimore Sun. Um, and Sarah really deserves a, an incredible amount of credit because she was really, uh, as far as I can tell, was really the first reporter uh, in the country to write extensively about the topic uh, we're about to cover, junk insurance. Uh, and the third, you'll hear from Joanne Volk. She's a research professor, founder, and co-director of the Center on Health Insurance Reform at Georgetown University's McCourt School of Public Policy. Uh, there, she directs research, authors papers, and provides technical assistance on state and federal regulation and legislation governing private health insurance uh, including the health insurance marketplace under the ACA. Uh, before going to Georgetown, Ms. Volk represented the AFL-CIO uh, before Congress and the administration on a broad range of healthcare issues, including employer-sponsored coverage, Medicaid, CHIP, uh, Medicare, healthcare quality, and healthcare workforce issues. Uh, so thank you to our three great panelists. And uh, Lucy, please kick us off. Okay, thanks, Ryan. Um, good afternoon, good morning, everyone, depending on where you are today. Um, thanks so much for having me. I'm going to uh, share just a couple of slides. Um, oh my goodness, okay. Give me one second to get that organized. Um, I think, how's that look? Looks great. Does that look like a slide deck? Excellent. <laughs> okay, um, so I, you know, as a starting point, Maybe I'll just start with why, you know, why do we call it junk insurance? Um, and you, you know, you might also hear a couple of other terms. Sometimes it's called non-compliant coverage, substandard coverage, low quality coverage. But junk is a term that's used kind of most often. And really it's to convey in the simplest of terms that we're talking about a product that is, is insurance like or you know, kind of looks like insurance that a consumer might think of as health insurance, but that doesn't actually meet minimum standards when it comes to um, covering and protecting them. Um, so I sort of think of this as uh, it looks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, but at best it's a pigeon and maybe it's not a bird at all. <laughs> um, and to put a finer point on that, you know, in the, in the 12 years since the passage of the ACA, you know, our collective understanding as a country of what healthcare coverage means has evolved to some degree, right? We, we expect to be able to buy and use our coverage even if we have a pre-existing condition. We expect to have coverage for the treatment and medications that we need. We expect there to be a maximum amount we'll have to pay every year. Um, and we expect to not have arbitrary caps placed on how much coverage we can access over the course of a year or our lives. Um, so, you know, is, as you see kind of in the chart here, right, it's, it's comprehensive coverage, covers all of these things, and what we kind of call junk plans um, really don't, um, or certainly don't have to. So one example of these types of plans that you may have heard of already um, are short-term plans or short-term limited duration plans, um, but there are others that have really similar contours out there. I, I won't describe all of them today, but I'm happy to answer questions or come back to these if we have time. Um, so other forms of you know, low quality or junk coverage might be things like healthcare sharing ministries, farm bureau plans, um, grandfather plans or, or coverage arrangement, arrangements that are sort of subject to ERISA but not state regulation, um, MIWAs or essential health plan or, or association health plans, um, and or even some accepted benefits. So, so there's really a mix of, of types of plans out there that, that again, might kind of 
not meet what we would think of as comprehensive. And, and oftentimes they're marketed to look like they are comprehensive, which is really where, where the concern comes in because um, that kind of, that design of plans effectively turns back the clock to the days before the ACA's patient protections. And as a result, patients are left really vulnerable to, you know, exorbitant bills, delays in care, really through no fault of their own. So I'll, moving along kind of to my next slide here. So, you know, what does this mean for, for real people? Um, this is Sam. Sam thought he was doing everything right. He's a small business owner who was experiencing back pain. So he spoke to an insurance broker about how upgrading his insurance plan um, could better cover you know, any treatment that he might need in the future. So Sam's broker insisted that they had the perfect plan for him and he went ahead and bought it. Uh, a month later, Sam sadly was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, after chemotherapy and radiation, he you know, fortunately um, did achieve remission, but his plan refused to pay. Um, they left Sam with more than $800,000 in medical debt. Uh, it turned out that, you know, little did he know when he purchased it, but after, after, um, after his treatment, it turned out that he had been sold one of these short-term limited duration plans and that they had stayed, cited a pre-existing condition and refused to cover his treatment. So, you know, I'm glad to say today that, that Sam is doing well, but his experience really illustrates, right, the risk that these plans can pose to consumers. People could be paying a premium each month, thinking that if the worst happens, they'll have access to care without, you know, really without sacrificing their financial future. But with plans like these, that protection just simply isn't guaranteed. So how did we get here? <laughs> um, we talked already a bit about the patient protections enshrined in the ACA, but again, if we think back to before 2010, you know, the individual insurance market was, was pretty wild. Um, most plans had annual and lifetime limits. They didn't cover basic services like prevention or prescription drugs. And they would, you know, they would just not sell to someone with a pre-existing condition, including things as common and controllable as like high blood pressure. And it really varied widely state to state. Some had pretty extensive, robust patient protections and, and some states had almost nothing. So among, of course, many, many other things, the ACA set, set a floor, right? It said that, um, you know, <laughs> granted that floor meant that a lot of states had to come up to a higher standard, but it also meant that for the first time, consumers had a guaranteed kind of standard level of protection from their plans. So, you know, if we fast forward to about 2017, that's, uh, there began a real shift away from regulation and regulating in the individual market and, and junk plans in particular. You know, whereas the Obama administration had taken many steps to fully and robustly enforce the ACA, the Trump administration really went in the opposite direction, creating the opportunity for, for junk plans, you know, like short-term plans to really proliferate. Um, so, so in the example of short-term plans, you know, these, these are plans that meant to be, that well, are, are meant to be really just what the name sounds like, right, short-term. Um, you know, think of them as, as kind of like a bridge between coverage, say if you're in between jobs or something like that. Um, and so the ACA, the, you know, the law, the legislation said that because these are short, they don't need to be as robust as, as comprehensive coverage. Um, you know, they don't have to meet that floor that I mentioned. Uh, so the Obama administration passed a rule defining that short term as, as, three, uh, as three months, which, you know, makes sense if we think a traditional health plan is a year, three months would be short or shorter. Um, however, in 2018, that rule was rewritten uh, under the, the Trump administration to redefine short term as being available for actually nearly three years. You could buy a plan for just under a year and then uh, tack onto it two more. So you could have one of these plans for just three days under three years. Um, you know, and, and really the impact of that is that it made it much easier um, to just confuse a short-term plan for something more comprehensive, right? Because we're so used to, again, being sold an entire year's worth of comprehensive coverage. Um, and what that means today is that regulation of junk plans is really largely back in the hands of states. So, Sticking here with our short-term plan example, what you'll see in the map um, 
are the current short-term plan regulations. So the states in red have really significant regulations in place, uh, including outright banning the sale of these plans. Um, those in dark gray uh, have some regulations in place, think like three to six month limits, similar to the previous rule. Um, and the rest, the light gray really go, the short-term plans go largely unchecked. There's little to no regulation at all in those states. Um, but the map isn't really the full story here because plans can actually be sold across state lines in some cases. So there was recent reporting actually in Inside Health Policy that um, you know of a story where a broker in Arizona um, in working with a family convinced them to leave their ACA comprehensive marketplace plan for something that they told them was, a, was better coverage at a lower price, right? We would all take that. Um, Sadly, not long after purchasing this new plan, one of the family members was in, in an accident and it required extensive um, emergency treatment. And that's when their health plan began refusing to return their calls or even acknowledging their claims. Um, and after weeks of calling, emailing, trying to get in touch with someone, the plan eventually refused to pay anything, citing a pre-existing condition and leaving the family with mountains of unpaid bills. It was only after that denial that the family learned that what they had purchased was actually a membership to join an association that was based in Texas that was selling them a plan that was actually based in Alabama. So I, you know, I share that because it's a really stark example of, it just illustrates there's only so much state regulators can do here um, when, when that kind of purchasing and, and scheming kind of across state lines can occur. And I'll, I'll wrap up here to say, um, you know, so what's the impact of, of junk plans? And I think the good news is we know a lot. Um, after the, you know, over the last several years, there has been a really significant effort to study how and why consumers purchase these plans, what the impact is if they receive a serious diagnosis, um, and what the impact is on the broader marketplace. Uh, for instance, you know, actuaries at Milliman actually looked at the impact of deregulation in 2019 and found that it was likely to increase, uh, you know, overall marketplace rates by 6% in, in states that didn't implement their own regulation versus those that did. In another report, um, we found that patients with COVID who, um, who had a short-term plan faced significant costs for their treatment, much, much more so than, you know, patients who had comprehensive coverage. And you know, I'll say organizations like LLS, Georgetown, Commonwealth, even Congress have studied the impacts and released reports that can be really helpful in, in learning more and understanding how these, you know, how these plans are in, impacting consumers today. Um, so with that, Ryan, I'll pause and turn it back over to you and, and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think the bottom line, um, and I'll, uh, I'll I'll highlight. Uh, LLS's uh, report on the left, which we worked on with uh, many other patient organizations. Um, every patient organization that you've heard of has has warned consumers uh, about the dangers of these plants. Um, so it's it's um, uh, it's scary stuff. So we're going to turn it over to uh, Sarah, who's done some amazing reporting on this and is uh, uh, well positioned to talk about the impact uh, of these plans on. Uh, actual patient, she um, she unfortunately has written some real horror stories about how these have uh, affected patients. Um, so I'll turn it over to Sarah. And in the meantime, keep those questions coming uh, in the chat. So Sarah, thank you. Hi, everyone. Happy to be here today. Um, I don't have any slides, but I do have some links to show you um, on my screen when we get to it. Um, I thought what would be most helpful would be if I talked a little bit about how I reported the stories that I did because um, I feel like it's it's a tough topic to understand, but it's an even tougher topic to explain and illustrate in a story that's going to make other people care about it. Um, so I became interested in this topic um, when I heard about a local university professor in the Philadelphia area who had gotten one of these big bills and kind of gotten stuck in a, in a bad position. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen here so you can see um, some of these links that I'm gonna show you. Um, so this woman, 
very smart college professor. Um, she has some underlying health conditions and she, um, that, that makes her very susceptible to infections. And when she was in the hospital, she contracted sepsis and um, was going to need a partial foot amputation. And she found out shortly before going into surgery that it was going to cost her um, a lot of money up front. Um, when we wrote the story, she had already accumulated at least $20,000 in medical debt. And after this, the bills kept coming in and it, it came close to $100,000. Um, I got from her all of her paperwork, all everything she had as far as bills, explanation of benefits from her insurance company. Um, anyone who's not familiar with the difference, a, a bill would be what the medical provider sends you. Um, and the uh, explanation of benefits would be what comes from your insurance company. And I've always found those to be really useful in helping understand people's billing problems because they will have codes that explain or rationalize why something's not being covered. Um, and that's always really helpful. Um, so this is kind of how I got started. And um, after this, I, I realized what a big problem it was and I really wanted to learn more about it. Um, so you know, one of the first things that I would recommend to anyone who wanted to do this type of reporting would be to get a sense of how your state stacks up as far as rights, as Luke pointed out. Um, not every state has this problem as significantly. Um, I always think this chart from the Commonwealth Fund is really helpful. It was helpful when I was reporting. It explains a lot of the different um, ways that plans get limited, but then also what types of laws states have. In our area, we care about um, New Jersey and Pennsylvania primarily. Um, New Jersey is one of the few states that just outright bans short-term policies. And so this really isn't so much of an issue there. But in Pennsylvania, there really are no rules. <laughs> They're not regulated by the state. Um, and not being regulated by the state also makes it really complicated or challenging to figure out what exactly is going on. Um, because when we're talking about comprehensive health insurance, which is the type of health insurance most people think of when they think of health insurance, those plans are tracked by the state. But these short-term plans, because they aren't regulated by the state, they also aren't tracked by the state. So it can be hard to get a sense of how big the problem is or what the scope of the issue is. Um, I found some ways to work around that. Um, one, one source that I found really useful was um, just talking to uh, our insurance administrator and um, some lawmakers who were interested in this issue. A senator in Pennsylvania had kind of taken up the issue of short-term plans and the insurance commissioner, um, while her ability to do anything about this issue was limited, she was very passionate about getting something done. And so they were helpful. And I, I learned that while these plans aren't regulated, the insurance department does have a place where people can file consumer complaints about insurance plans. Um, I think a lot of other states have something like this. Pennsylvania, you could file a complaint specifically through the insurance administration. You can also file a healthcare complaint through the attorney general's office. Um, and this, this is a very mineable resource, um, especially if you can uh, find someone who is helpful with a public information request. I was able to work with the office to get a list of complaints um, with contact information for people who were okay with, with being contacted by a reporter. And, you know, I don't know that that's necessarily common, but again, it was an issue that the agency felt strongly about, but they felt um, not in a position to do a lot about themselves. So they were sympathetic to, to my cause of wanting to contact people. So um, that's how I found a lot of the real people, quote unquote, real people in these stories. That's obviously a, a key source that you need to have someone who has a complaint, someone who has had a problem. 
Um, there was this woman here who um, found out when she went to use her plan that it was not real. Um, another woman who found out her plan wasn't real <laughs> when it didn't pay for some broken bones. Um, and this guy over here, he had congestive heart failure and uh, he was denied coverage for it because they claimed that it was a pre-existing condition even though he didn't receive the diagnosis until he'd already bought the plan. So these real people are important for telling stories because it puts a face on it. It helps readers see that there is really someone out there dealing with this. Um, you know, but those aren't, aren't the only sources that you need. Um, and it can be a little challenging to um, come up with sources for stories like this, only because there aren't that many people who study it that specifically. So you, it helps if you can get a little bit creative. Um, I wanted to look at, for example, um, a story here. Um, the woman that I talked to, she just, she was absolutely convinced that she'd bought an Obamacare plan. And so I shaped the story around um, how, how deceptive these plans are in um, their marketing. They look just like healthcare.gov. You know, like for example, if you go here and you Google Obamacare health insurance, The first several hits that come up are ads for not healthcare.gov. This website, for instance, looks a lot like healthcare.gov. Um, you know, and it, it will have sometimes at the top a little note saying that it's not affiliated with the government. Um, but they're really made to look like, like healthcare.gov, like the legitimate website. They're not intending to sell these plans to people who want short-term coverage. They're intending to sell these plans to people who are looking for legitimate health insurance. And that's really what's troubling is that, um, you know, the people who sell this type of junk make the argument that, well, everyone has the choice of what to buy if people don't want to pay for full health insurance that's their choice and this is an option for them but the the thing is most of the people who buy these plans think that it's real health insurance they think they're buying real health insurance so just for another example even if you google healthcare.gov you know like how many older people do you know who the first thing they do is they go to google and they type in what they're looking for even when you type in the exact website healthcare.gov the first hits that come up are ads or not healthcare.gov. You have to actually scroll to get to healthcare.gov. So um, anyway, I talked to some online ad nerds and website developers who talked a little bit about some of this stuff. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, another tip that I thought um, could be useful is just thinking outside the box of how you present the material these stories um, can be really, really dry if you don't put in some effort to make them interesting. Um, I always read them when I see them, <laughs> but a lot of people don't. Um, in one instance, I, I was really fascinated at one point by just what the sales pitch must be because these are college professors, highly educated people, um, you know, people who even have worked in healthcare before, who are getting sucked into these plans. Like, what are these salespeople saying that is so convincing that leads people into something that is so dramatically different than what they think they're buying? Um, so I found out that there had been a lawsuit suing one of the companies that is sort of a of those back room, back boiler room type sales places, um, and they sell these types of plans. It was a lawsuit, a Pennsylvania investigator had been involved. And through the lawsuit, I was able to get his testimony because these are all public records. Um, 
And as part of his testimony, he had submitted an actual script that, that the salespeople used during their calls. He had done a visit to a, um, a sales house and talked to people and he had gotten this script. Um, and so I went through it with him as well as um, a psychology professor who studies language at, Pen at University of Pennsylvania. And we went through and we annotated it and we threw it up on the story so that people could see exactly what we were talking about. Um, you know, so here, here is that, here's the script and here are the notes that they had. Um, you know, and it really showed the ways that language is manipulated to, to get people through this conversation of buying a crappy health plan without asking too many questions. You know, here, um, you know, they're pointing out that the, the salesperson puts words in their mouth and tells them what they want rather than asking. Here, um, the, the professor that I talked to pointed out that rather than saying, um, what type of health plan do you want? It, they, they make a statement and then say, right? <laughs> and, and she and I talked about how um, in social conversation, we all have a tendency to um, speak in the affirmative. It's, it's more comfortable for us to uh, agree and go along and advance a conversation that way than to, it, it takes more effort to actively say, well, no, actually this. Um, you know, and here again, telling people what they do or don't need, um, making kind of just bizarre promises, um, like unlimited access, whatever that means. Um, Anyway, so I thought this was really interesting. I'm kind of nerdy about healthcare stuff. So other people probably didn't think this was as interesting as I did, but I was super excited about it. Um, just an extra pitch for places to find sources. Um, lawsuits are a great place to look. If you go to some of the, um, if you go to some of the websites that um, sell this stuff, you can, um, search for their names in, in legal databases and try to find if there are any lawsuits related to that. Um, the Better Business Bureau or really any other place that people might be complaining about experiences they've had with, um, with insurance companies. Yelp reviews, Google reviews, those are all places that um, you could try mining for, for sources. Um, I also at one point was really obsessed with trying to find someone who actually sold this stuff to talk to me. Um, and I convinced my editor to, to let me sign up um, on the company's dime for a Indeed employer account, which lets you see people's resumes. Um, so I searched for people who had previously worked at, but did not currently work at some of these um, sales houses. Um, it was a lot of, it was a lot more work than was fruitful, but, um, I did, I did have a good interview that I was able to include one of my stories, um, of someone, you know, describing in detail how, how the, uh, sales teams work, and how aggressive they were in sales and how they convinced people to buy stuff and all the rewards that salespeople got if they sold, um, what they needed to sell. Um, so anyway, I'm happy to answer any questions about this later, but that's a little bit about how I've done the reporting on this type of topic. Sarah, thank you so much. That's extremely helpful. And um, wow, so, so many resources you pointed uh, folks to. Um, I, I know that's going to pay dividends for a lot of the journalists on this call. Um, you, you talked a little bit about the misleading marketing uh, of these plans, which is a perfect segue uh, to Joanne, who can tell us um, a little bit more about her work, which is uh, uh, fairly, well, she's been doing it for a while, but has a fairly recent report uh, all about the marketing of these plans, because it's so important for folks to realize that uh, in many cases, 
or perhaps even most of these cases, um, this isn't this isn't just people signing up for something and, and they don't like what they buy. It's often pe people have no idea what they were buying and were and were tricked into buying it. Um, so Joanne would would love uh, would love to hear from you all about the marketing of these plants. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Ryan. That was a perfect setup. I was nodding my head a lot during Sarah's presentation. I do have some slides um, and some screenshots that I'll, I want to share with folks. Okay. Um, all right, I'm going to talk about just how consumers who set out to buy a comprehensive Affordable Care Act coverage wind up somewhere completely different and with um, awful consequences. Um, I just just a bit about who we are. Um, we're, we're part of the McCourt School of Public Policy at Georgetown University. We're a team of experts that study legal um, and, and regulatory landscape for federal and state um, regulation of private insurance. We also track market trends. We publish reports, studies, and blog posts, and uh, provide technical assistance to state federal um, officials, as well as patient and consumer organizations on private insurance matters. Um, so I'm going to spend a little time talking about our, this most recent report that Ryan mentioned um, I did with a colleague, uh, Danya Palanker. Um, entitled Misleading Marketing of Non-ACA Health Plans Continued During COVID-19 Special Enrollment Period. And um, basically what we did was we tried to, we, we replicated a study that colleagues had done in 2019, a secret shopper um, study. Uh, last year, um, there was a special COVID enrollment opportunity for the marketplace. Typically the Obamacare, the ACA marketplaces are only open um, for two and a half months beginning in the fall. Um, because of COVID, there was a special enrollment opportunity that essentially lasted nearly the full year that people could sign up for comprehensive coverage without um, any discrimination based on health status, the, the ACA plans. And there was much more um, financial help available to buy plans because of the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, the subsidies were more generous for people and there was no income limit on who could qualify. They lifted the cap at 400% of poverty to make um, premium subsidies available to everyone um, based on their income, but regardless, um, you know, you would qualify for a, a, um, premium assistance. Um, so many consumers, because of that, could enroll in coverage that had, you know, a zero premium, zero dollar premium or very low premiums. We developed two profiles for shoppers um, that would have qualified for, based on their income, $2 um, premiums in the marketplace with much lower out-of-pocket costs with special plans called cost-sharing reduction plans in the marketplaces. Um, we wanted to understand during this period where you could sign up for comprehensive coverage um, with you know, historic uh, financial assistance, would people still be directed uh, to these non-ACA plans with greater costs? And they were. Um, what we did is th th there were two profiles, a 28-year-old named Donnie who, without any pre-existing conditions, and then a 48-year-old named Jen who takes generic medication for high cholesterol and has an unspecified heart condition. And you saw from the script that Sarah you know, showed that um, it would often ask about, um, do you take any medications? So they could sort of determine whether or not you had a health condition that they wouldn't want to necessarily cover. Um, both were in one person households with an annual income of $20,000 and searching for new coverage because of loss of employer sponsor coverage. So they were able to enroll because of the special enrollment opportunity, but individually also qualified for a special enrollment period um, because they had lost other coverage. And that entitles you to an opportunity to enroll in marketplace plans. Uh, to see how the two profiles would be treated, we performed internet searches for four terms that might be used by consumers shopping for health insurance, as Sarah did, ACA enrolled, cheap health insurance, healthcare.gov and Obamacare plans, and then hit the first three websites um, that came up in that search results uh, and entered some information about those profiles. And then the calls started coming in. It doesn't take very long and you can get quickly overwhelmed with the calls. My colleague, Danya, took calls from 10 sales representatives for each of the consumer profiles for a total of 20 representatives. Um, of the co phone calls with 20 representatives, only five recommended marketplace coverage, um, which without a doubt, based on their income and circumstances, would have been the best coverage for them and the lowest cost. Rather than being directed to the ACA plans, the consumers were far more likely to be referred to fixed indemnity plans, 
healthcare sharing ministries, short-term plans, and other non-ACA products that were impossible to categorize with any certainty based on the information that was made available. And this is, you know, my colleague who's an insurance expert had to sort of read between the lines to understand that it was, um, she was being sold either a short-term plan, which as Lucy said, um, does not have to comply with any of the consumer protections of the Affordable Care Act, um, fixed indemnity plans, which just pay a fixed amount of money, you know, for a hospital visit, it's not insurance that covers um, your needs. Uh, healthcare sharing ministries, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, um, and other products, not ACA plans. The alternative plans were typically more expensive than the marketplace plans and had higher cost sharing. The representatives repeatedly provided misleading information about the alternative plans that were selling, they were selling, as well as false statements about the cost and features of marketplace plans. So not only did they misrepresent the plans they were selling, they misrepresented the alternative in the marketplace. Um, in some cases, for example, saying, oh, you'll have a huge deductible if you do that, and not even recognizing that um, they would have qualified for substantial financial assistance. In all instances, the alternative plans that representatives recommended were more expensive, and in some cases, much more expensive than marketplace plans available to the two profiles that we created. In addition, three representatives mentioned a one-time enrollment fee as high as $99. It is common for alternative plans to be sold through associations that have a non-refundable enrollment fee or membership fee. Only one representative would provide written information without first requiring that um, the shoppers provide um, pay for the first month's coverage and any applicable enrollment fee. It was impossible otherwise to get any information about the plan they were enrolling in. Um, the results represented, I'm sorry, the results replicated what others have found. Lucy mentioned some of these studies by the Energy and Commerce Committee, our own colleagues study in 2019, a US government accountability office um, undercover um, investigation with recorded interviews, uh, recorded phone calls with brokers and researchers at Brookings all did secret shopper um, type of um, plans and I'm sorry, studies and found um, similar results. And perhaps the greatest proof at all, of all was I recently got a phone call from a local reporter who was describing um, his contact with a consumer who was basically describing exactly our research methodology and what happened, what they were, where they were directed. Um, this is not, these are not outlier experiences. This is a matter of business practice for these companies and it's hard for consumers to escape. Um, in addition to these phone calls, there are also misleading websites. It's another way that consumers um, can sometimes be duped into buying something that is not in fact comprehensive coverage. A little bit more about healthcare sharing ministries if you don't know much about them. Um, they are not insurance at all. There is no guarantee that they will pay anything for um, members insurance uh, uh, healthcare bills. Um, but they often use terms and features that are very similar to insurance. So um, individuals, consumers um, feel like they're buying something akin to insurance and often even better than insurance because they'll say things like, um, you know, they'll play up that it's not an insurance company, it's like-minded individuals who, who will be helping pay for your healthcare bills. Um, I'm gonna share some examples of screenshots that, um, you know, when a consumer would see them, it would look a lot like insurance. So this of course is one healthcare sharing ministry that uses the same terms as the Affordable Care Act metal levels in the marketplace, gold, silver, and bronze are the types of plans that you can buy from them. Another healthcare sharing ministry suggests that there's a network of providers, which just like insurance, if you went to their preferred network, you'd have lower costs. If you went outside the network, you'd pay more. Um, there are in fact no contracts with providers. It doesn't operate like insurance at all that you would go to the provider and they would be paid directly by your insurance company. The members are always on the hook for the full cost and, and hope to be reimbursed um, by the healthcare sharing ministry. And finally, many use testimonials from members that suggest that despite any disclaimers that it's not insurance and there's no guarantee to pay, in fact, there's been a history that they've always taken care of their members' healthcare bills. Um, I wanted to share one recent scam that's been in the news in case it's come across your desk, Salveson Healthcare. Um, is a fixed indemnity plan that was marketed as an ACA compliant plan, met all, which means it would have met all those consumer protections Lucy was talking about, when in fact it was neither ACA compliant or 
um, even licensed to sell insurance. Um, despite that, the plan enrolled 65,000 people nationwide, including people who were shopping for ACA coverage and instead were directed to Selvison. Based on state Department of Insurance investigations, the company appeared to use a number of broker intermediaries, shell websites, and unstaffed phone lines that not only made it difficult for consumers to obtain help, but for regulators to track them down and take action. Multiple states have taken action now to shut it down, uh, the parent company, and granted consumers who bought that coverage a special enrollment period, healthcare.gov got healthcare did too, recognizing that people landed in insurance they did not intend to buy. Well, it wasn't insurance, it was on licensed and had an opportunity to enroll in the marketplace outside of open enrollment. Um, states that have done so already include Colorado, Kentucky, Massachusetts, Minnesota, and Nevada. Um, so there are some things that federal officials and, and state officials can do. Um, I think Sarah had a reference to this somewhere. This is an action that the FTC took against simple health plans. And this is a, a quote from the report that basically says that you know, people were misled into buying um, skinny coverage, uh, coverage that did not cover what they, the vast majority of their medical expenses. They thought they were buying comprehensive coverage. Um, and this was, uh, you know, the business practice of this entity. Uh, state officials can also help. There's been a recent action in Massachusetts. The attorney general um, there brought a case against Mega Life and Health Insurance Company. Um, that was, you know, selling supplemental or limited benefit plans to people who were looking for comprehensive ACA plans. And importantly, the judge concluded that the illegal sales tactics were pervasive and the result of company training, not just a rogue sales agent. And so again, Sarah shared that script. This is not just some, you know, an occasional broker, you get a bad apple. Um, this is part of the, the business plan and, and sales um, tactics for these for, for some of these companies and it's really hard for a consumer to 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 fare well against that um, so you know there's there are some actions that state and federal officials can take um, but as long as there's junk insurance out there and you saw the map um, more prevalent in some states than others um, you know consumers must really be on alert to make sure that they know what they're buying. It can be difficult, um, but they, you know, if, if I think if you all have a role in um, alerting consumers to the scams and misleading marketing that's out there, they might fare a little better. I will say this is a year round problem. Um, these, uh, these misleading marketing tactics are going on throughout the year, but we see an uptick, especially during open enrollment period when they know people are actively shopping for coverage between November 1st and January 15th. And also I wanna just um, flag for folks that um, when the public health emergency is, is it ends, is declared over, um, state and Medicaid programs can begin reassessing people um, for their Medicaid coverage to assess whether or not they continue to be eligible for that coverage or should be enrolled in something else. 15 million people are likely to come off of Medicaid at that point, and about 5 million people will be determined, it's estimated, will likely be eligible for marketplace plans with subsidies. That is just a you know, goldfish in a bowl for some of these marketers to, to recognize that they're going to be people shopping for coverage. And people who have, don't have experience with private insurance, they previously had Medicaid coverage and now have to go buy private insurance, and I think may be more vulnerable than even um, others to being misled down to this coverage that will not um, meet their health care needs and will leave them you know, with un bills that they can't possibly meet. So um, I want to share some tips for smarter shopping that I think you all have a role in, in sharing with your, your um, readers to help them um, understand some of their options here. Um, as Sarah said, use healthcare.gov to find ACA plans. Again, if you don't go directly to healthcare.gov or if you don't scroll down to like the eighth hit, um, you won't get there. But if you, if you get there, um, it will, you know, that's a place for most people to enroll in coverage or about half the states to enroll in coverage. Others where um, there are states that operate their own marketplace like Covered California or Penny in Pennsylvania, um, uh, that healthcare.gov will direct you there. They ask for your state and they'll send you directly to that, that, that website. You won't get, you know, put out in the world to, fair, to try to find your, your website again. 
The marketplace, the healthcare.gov or your state-based marketplace is the only place guaranteed, guaranteed to sell only ACA plans. Um, and it's the only place to get subsidies for premiums and out-of-pocket costs for those who qualify based on income. Um, there are ACA plans sold outside the marketplace in most states, but you are, as Lucy said, in the Wild West at that point. There's everything else out there too. And it's hard to know that you're getting an ACA plan. Um, I would also recommend people use marketplace navigators. These are um, individuals and sometimes organizations that are trained and funded from the marketplace to sell coverage. They do not receive commissions. They will only sell ACA plans. A lot of marketplaces, including healthcare.gov, also work with um, certified brokers. Um, many are reputable and uh, know, know their plans well and will look out for their clients' best interests, but they all do receive commissions. And you know, some, some um, insurance companies pay better than others. Almost all insurance companies pay more, including healthcare sharing ministries, pay greater commissions than the ACA plans. So there are financial incentives involved for brokers and who sell ACA plans and other coverage. Um, suggest that they get full information prior to providing any method of payment. Um, as I said in our study, um, you know, you would have to provide your first month's premium before you can actually see what you just enrolled in. Um, if the sales rep requires the consumer to share any health information, some of those questions you saw in Sarah's script, um, sometimes I'll ask you to actually fill out a questionnaire or agree to a physical exam. Um, that is not an ACA plan. It gets a little tricky because a navigator or even a broker might say, you know, one to know, if you're a person with diabetes, you might want to take that into account when you're looking at the formulary or the provider network for a plan. Sometimes, sometimes it can be helpful, but if it's coercive and, and really is a condition of enrolling in coverage, that's not an ACA plan. And then as others have suggested, research the company. You can look at the Better Business on Bureau on, on online reviews. Um, people do make complaints there. I will say I, it's, you know, you know in terms of your insurance department, um, you can call the Department of Insurance and you can learn which, you know, how to do that in your state from this website, the National Association of Insurance Commissioners maintains all that information. You can confirm with your state insurance department that the broker you're speaking with and the insurance company they're trying to sell you a plan from are in fact licensed by the state. And if a consumer comes across a misleading marketing, whether it's brokers, robocalls, websites, or particular companies, they should report it to their Department of Insurance. Um, but a lot of consumers don't know to do that. So, you know, we'll often talk to folks in the insurance departments and they say, if they get one call, it probably means there's a hundred more like them because people just don't know that their insurance department exists or know how to find them or know that it's an option to report. Um, so it's a good source. I would, well, I would definitely encourage people to report complaints there because it does um, for many insurance departments, it's, it's what helps them understand where they want to investigate and, and put their resources to, um, you know, understand whether or not something is even licensed to sell insurance or using misleading marketing. Um, so the, the study that I mentioned in the, in our blog are available on our website and many of the, um, a lot of the Commonwealth Fund studies that Sarah talked about, uh, we've done a lot of work on junk plans, how they're sold, what they cover or don't cover. Um, so there are many more resources on our website and I'm happy to take questions as well. Hi there, um, my name is Brianna Wilson. I am the Senior Manager of Advocacy Communications here at LLS, um, and I'll be here to kick the questions off. So if you have questions, put them in the chat. Um, my first question is for Sarah or Joanne. Um, you both mentioned a bit about talking to people who actually sell these junk plans. Do, you, do the people that are selling these plans actually know that they're junk plans or what is their level of awareness about the dangers of these plans? Do they know how dangerous they are or do they just know, oh, I make more commission for this particular plan? They absolutely know. <laughs> um, I found that it's most helpful to talk to people who have moved on from that position. Um, the one woman that I was able to include in, in one of my stories, she, 
had gotten this job. She needed a job. Um, and once she got into it, she didn't know much about that company when she started, but as she continued selling the plans, she, um, she got really uncomfortable, um, with what she was being asked to do and the type of, um, questions she was encouraged to ask or not ask. Um, and she ended up leaving for a different job. Um, and, and that's the type of person that I've found is most open to talking about it. Obviously, you know, that's not a totally unbiased point of view. Someone who's no longer with their employer could have beef with their employer or have a reason to speak ill against them. But um, I've never had much success in talking to companies, um, executives. Uh, they they typically don't want to talk about it because they know that it's it's not so great. <laughs> um, but I would say that by and large, the brokers who are selling this stuff know exactly what they're selling um, because you can't just decide that tomorrow you're going to be an insurance broker. It it is a certification. You have to know something about health insurance or insurance in general in order to be able to sell it. Yeah, and I will just add, they do have to meet professional standards in, in order to have, a, you know, to be licensed um, to sell insurance in, in a state. It's, it's a state function to regulate them and set the professional standards. Um, and so we've sometimes found that reputable brokers are happy to share <laughs> that there are others out there that are selling junk. As I said, because often these junk plans pay higher commissions. And if it's a broker who really understands insurance and wants to do right by their, their clients, um, they do not like that there are the other guys out there, other people out there um, selling junk and getting paid more to do it and it, you know leaving people bare when, when they get the healthcare bills. So finding a reputable broker is, is a good source too. Absolutely, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks, thanks to you both. Um, my next question is for Sarah. What do you think is the most shocking thing that you've learned about junk plans throughout your reporting? Oh, wow. Um, there are a lot of really shocking things about them. I think one, one thing that I thought was um, just really, really fascinating was um, how just about anything can be considered a pre-existing condition um, under these plans. I talked to one woman who'd broken her wrist and uh, dislocated some vertebrae or done something to her back. She fell, basically. She fell on the ice. It's cold. You know, she fell. Um, and her plan was refusing to pay for it because they claimed that this accident related to a pre-existing condition. They somehow uh, managed to go back in her health records before she even had this plan and concluded that she was at elevated risk for like brittle bones. I mean, she was older. So like anyone, when we age, our bones, that's just the, what happens. <laughs> like it's, it's not a pre-existing condition. Um, but so they declined to pay for um, the therapy and surgery that she needed for a fall accident because it was a pre-existing condition. Um, so that was pretty shocking. I also thought that the um, reading the script that the companies use was really interesting. Um, I was also shocked at how little regulation there is of these plans. Um, and again, that does vary by state. In Pennsylvania, they are not really regulated. So I thought that that was interesting just considering how much regulation there is of virtually everything else everywhere. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, it looks like we do not have any additional questions. So thank you to all of our panelists.